All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to this conversation with Thomas DeLauer and the Dave Castro to talk about uh, a really interesting event that took place, what was it, in June? Uh, that uh, consisted of some long fasting, long hikes, or rucking with uh, some weight on their back. And uh, the, the whole point of this interview right here is just to really discuss We'll discuss a lot of things. One, why in the hell did we do it? Or did you guys do it? One. Uh, two, what took place during those 35 miles physiologically? Uh, and then three, what were the lesson lear lessons learned and, and how can we apply those lessons if there were any lessons learned? So that's kind of the goals of this interview. Uh, but before we get started, uh, I'd love to just get a little bit of perspective from the both of you on, um, what, you know, what, what, what was the event? So I'll start with Thomas. What, when, what, when did the event take place? Yeah, this was in earliest June. I think we ended up doing it on, on June 12th, you know, and the idea behind mm -hmm. it was let's just see and prove to ourselves that we can do an extended endurance event with absolutely no food and going into it in a moderate length of a fast going into it and just kind of, I don't want to say prove a point, but prove to ourselves more than anything, but also kind of understand a little bit more about what happens as far as the body's chapters, if you want to call it that, when you're doing a longer event like this with no food and what physiologically changes and alters and how the body has some pretty epic survival mechanisms that come into place to make sure that you, uh, you get through it. Okay. So look, before we dig into any more detail on that, and, and Dave, I got a couple questions for you. What was it? What was the actual event? So we went uh, 35 miles with 35 pounds, uh, totally fasted. So it was minimum of 12 hours fasted at the beginning. And then, of course, not eating until at least the end. So, you know, by the time everything was done, most of us were at least 24 hours fasted by the end. Uh, so 35 miles with 35 pounds, no real time set. We weren't going for any specific time. It was going to take however long it took. And uh, yeah, that was really the idea. Pretty straightforward. How long were you? How long were you fasted, Thomas, prior to starting? Uh, it was about fourteen hours in. Dave. What about yeah, you? the same. All of us, and Thomas will go into this, I imagine, but all of us were put on a strict uh, protocol, eating protocol, leading up to it that Thomas uh, gave to us. And so, I think what was our last meal? Uh, was, was it five or six the day before? Yeah. Something yeah. Like yep. Yeah. Five p.m. That was kind of that early uh time restricted feeding was the yep exactly yeah we wanted to i wanted to have everyone sort of front load as much of their calories earlier in the day and then kind of taper them off as the day went on well let's dig into that because um i had that uh down at the bottom of some of these questions but let's talk about that protocol leading up so can you go into a little bit more detail on what that consisted of uh from meal one all the way to the last meal yeah i mean in short there's always sort of this thought process with early time restricted feeding or even tapered eating where you want to have the majority of your calories in the morning and then sort of taper on as the day goes on. So kind of the saying is you know, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. So you kind of taper off just <laughs> because it aligns with circadian rhythms anyway. So the idea behind mm -hmm. that, as the day went on, we actually decreased protein and increased fats. And that's for a multitude of reasons. The main reason is satiety and kind of incubating the body a little bit more with fats so that when you do go into that fasted state, you have the ready fuel available. Not that there's anything wrong with carbohydrates, but if you went with a high carb meal as your last meal prior to going into a fast, you would have a little bit of a blood sugar roller coaster that would make the fast more difficult. So by kind of tapering the way that we did and keeping it close to ketogenic as possible, not forcing anyone to do keto or go that route. But that day prior, the more that you can limit the carbs prior to a fast, the less you will deal with sort of the struggle of the fast and kind of the, the hunger pangs and whatnot. So would this be, with this version of um, time or early time restricted feeding be something that's specific to a protocol used prior to a, a prolonged fast? Or would this be something that people would use as a, just a general intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding protocol. Yeah, I think I mean, generally speaking, it's perfect for people that are doing intermittent fasting to begin with, because more and more of the research is starting to point to early time restricted feeding or ETRF as really the more stable way to go about it. <clears throat> and the reason that I say that is if you're skipping breakfast and doing intermittent fasting, sort of the, I call it the old school way, just the traditional way, 
essentially you kind of end up in just a caloric restricted phase. You don't really end up in, it's, it's awesome to go for an extended period of time, you know, 14, 16 hours without food. That's great for insulin resistance. That's great for insulin sensitivity in general. But when it comes down to day over day over day doing that, at the end of the day, the bulk, the benefits of skipping breakfast really just come down to caloric restriction and you're not getting a whole, whole lot above and beyond of that unless you're extending it. That being said, if you flip that on its head and you start skipping dinner and you do that occasionally, for one, you're in line with your circadian rhythms more. So it's kind of aligning and allowing kind of the body to adapt to its natural sort of clock, if you want to call it that. But also just we have less in the way from a gene expression level of genes that are associated with storage in the morning than we do in the evening. So in other words, we can get away with eating more food earlier in the day than we can mm. in the evening. And that applies for everybody. So it kind of comes back to like, even if you're not doing ETRF, tapering your calories as the day goes on is just a good habit to get into in the first place. But for us going into an event like this, it allows us to sort of weave into this fasting strategy without just going cold turkey. Having most people, when they first start fasting, they say, I'm going to have you know a 2000 calorie meal because I'm not going to eat for 24 hours. Unfortunately, that's the wrong way to go about it because then you're sending all these mixed signals to your body. It's better to taper mm. off and kind of ease into it. Interesting. Okay, cool. Uh, and I know both of you have quite a bit of experience with fasting. Uh, what types of protocols do you typically follow? Would this be something, Thomas, that you typically follow like that? I follow all of it. I mean, I mess around. I'm always my own N of one. So I try to, you know, the body's highly adaptable and that's the idea, right? The body just becomes very efficient at what you continue to do. So right now I'm on a big ETRF kick. So I do that all the time. I do it, you know, three or four days a week. Sometimes it drives the family crazy because I'll skip dinner, but you know, I will reach a point where there's a line of diminishing return with that sort of routine. So I might flip it on its head. So I always, for me, I like to flip the time periods in which I start my fast. So let's pretend for a second that you get different benefits from fasting throughout different periods of the day. So if I were to start my fast at 7 a.m. and went for 24 hours, I would be basically retrieving all kinds of different benefits from that fast throughout different periods of the day. If I decided to sure. start at noon, I would get a completely different set of benefits. Hmm. I mean, the general benefits remain the same, but then if I started at 5 p.m. and I went to 5 p.m. the next day, I'm experiencing the deeper state of the fast at a different time of day each time. So I am hmm. really big on rotating my start times and rotating my end times. Interesting. And Mike, I wouldn't say that. Dave, uh, what do you, what do you, uh, Mike, I would not say that I'm, with. Uh, my intermittent fasting is all new and it's relative to having, when I was introduced to Thomas, I, I've experimented a lot with low carb stuff and we'll call it keto. But then when Thomas okay. suggested recently this, okay. this effort, yeah, that's when I started diving into uh, fasting. And prior to that, you know, it's funny, the fasting story with me. When Greg was around and Greg was, you know, he got really big into fasting and all these experts that Karn and everyone was bringing in. And truthfully, I actually kind of um, like a child rallied against it. <laughs> like Greg was kind of forcing <laughs> fasting and that keto scene <laughs> on us. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to I'm not going to buy into it just yet. So it was it, it's like so many other things in my path through CrossFit. I kind of had to find it on my own. I had to get comfortable with, with diving into keto, get comfortable with diving into call it low carb, and then eventually get comfortable diving into fasting on my own terms. Greg, four or five years ago was fasting a lot and pushing it on some of us and I just didn't do it. But so, and interestingly, listening to, to Thomas talk right now, the ETRF, the first time I did that was for the protocol for the rut. Prior to that, we didn't talk a lot about that. And all I was doing and did a lot of was just the skip breakfast fast type fast last meal at six, skip breakfast. And then, um, and then I eventually built up to skipping lunch too and doing a 24 hour fast. But the big thing with me in the fasting for this event was anytime I fasted, which was two to three times a week, I always made sure I trained in that fast zone just to see how my body would respond to, um, to training. Mm in the fast because we were going to rock fast. And so I wanted to prepare the same way. Really cool. So I want to bring back, bring this back to, uh, um, something you had said in the very beginning, uh, the both of you said, or, or Thomas, you said you guys were 
maybe not necessarily trying to prove a point, but I think there was something to that. And if there was a point you were trying to prove, even if it is to yourself, what, what was that? And is it different for, for each of you? I think proving a point is probably the long, wrong word. Even if I, I said that even to myself, you know, for me, it was <laughs> more okay. about an experiment really and seeing what would happen. Uh, personally, I was, I was actually just curious from the biomechanical standpoint, I knew metabolically, it wouldn't really be an issue for me because I, I play in that world all the time, but biomechanically, yeah. I was more concerned of like, what's, what's, what's going to happen if, you know, you don't have fuel and muscle contractions might kind of be altered a little bit and your firing patterns might be a little bit weird, you know, what's going to happen to me biomechanically. So that was the bigger concern or what I wanted to prove to myself. Um, uh, I was really in it more so for the story within my body, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, I had created right. videos before talking about various zones of fasting because they're pretty clear and defined and we can talk about those if you want, but, you know, clear and defined in terms of, okay, you burn through glycogen and then you move into this next phase where your body starts kind of upregulating gluconeogenesis and like, all. it's very clear and defined and almost really can be felt if you're paying attention to it. And it's only exacerbated when you're doing an endurance event. And essentially what we were accomplishing was accelerating a fast. You know, we were mm -hmm. in a colloquial way of putting it, we were almost condensing like a three or four day fast into one day by doing a low grade intensity work for a long period of time in a fasted state. It was like we were accelerating a fast. So it was a lot easier to sort of go through the storytelling of the various zones and chapters that the body goes through. Okay. And we're going to talk about those. I think I, I pulled some questions based off of, um, just some of the information that you threw out there throughout those different chapters or those different you know, parts of the fast. But for that, Dave, how did you, how did you get involved, Dave? And, and was the, uh, the goal the same for you or is it just like, this sounds. Well, well the goal like for me is a little something different. Something uh, hard to do and I'm in. I've been, so, you know, for, for the last decade and a half, we've been big proponents of the zone diet, which is essentially a, lower carb diet than traditional um, American recommendations, but it's not entirely a low carb diet. Then stuff did start skewing with Greg and some of his yeah. um, research more towards lower carb um, lifestyles and lower carb prescription, especially for the average CrossFitter. But really in the last five years or so, this super high carb kind of lifestyle is infecting the, and, and, and Thomas won't say it as strongly as I will, or maybe others across the world, but yeah, high carbs is, uh, can be very detrimental to health. And we say that a little more openly than Thomas does. Um, but so some of the, the, the high carb stuff was coming into the scene via the athletes. And, and I saw average CrossFitters getting influenced by the athletes and the things they post and the normal, the average CrossFitter, the person who's trying to, um, change their life, improve their health, shouldn't be taking um, recommendations from these guys who are training all day, or not recommendations, let me reframe that phrase that they shouldn't, I hated seeing them influenced so heavily by those characters, by those athletes. So I wanted to start experimenting on the super low carb stuff and see if I could still do CrossFit and perform at a decent level, not a high level, but like a decent level for a gym goer on like really low carb. And so for the last two or three years, I've experimented a lot with that and um, minus the fasting. And I, I was fine with, uh, with most CrossFit efforts, with most CrossFit challenges. And I would have in testing workouts with, for the games, not myself, but having athletes test them, I would always have these discussions with the athletes. I'd ask them, tell me what you're eating. And you know, 150 grams of a protein, 350 grams of carbohydrate and then a hundred of fat. And it always baffled me because there was a couple, there, there are a couple athletes I've spoken to who did experiment with the low carb eating that was more common in our community, um, six, seven, eight years ago. And basically what they talk about, and this is all intuitive to, to what, um, super low carb and keto is good for is they said on the, um, longer duration stuff, they were completely fine. It was really on the short stuff that they didn't feel that good. So I wanted to just play with it and experiment and see where it affected me. And, and frankly, honestly, I, I felt 
I adapted and I performed well in all various stages. So then take this to the fasting part. I wanted to try to see the same thing with fasting. So while fasted, could I still do short CrossFit workouts and be not um, at 100%, but still perform them and do well at them? Could I do explosive movements while fasted? Could I do long stuff while fasted? Well, obviously the long stuff is fine. Um, but I did get to a point where I felt I could do CrossFit workouts. And one of my little benchmarks is just 10 rounds of Cindy. Um, to know kind of where I'm at in life, how fit I am, I'll do 10 rounds of Cindy four times. And um, like the fastest I've ever done it was like in, at uh, low eight minutes. And that was while well fasted about, or not sorry, not fasted, while well, super low carb, probably a year and a half ago. But recently, while well, in a fasted state, I did that in, uh, in like around nine minutes. And anytime I'm under 10 on that is, is good for me. So I'm like, I, I have good results. So it's been an interesting experiment to try to, for myself, validate and speak to when I talk to CrossFitters, hey, um, definitely don't take cues from the games athletes in terms of how much uh, volume of carbohydrate they're eating. And actually, you can thrive, you can do CrossFit with a lot less. So that's where I was coming at it from. It just says, it's kind of like him, but a different experiment. I have a couple questions or a question real quick, but before that you broke up on my end, I'm not sure if you broke up for uh, everyone else, but can you, it was right when you were describing the kind of macronutrient breakdown of some of the games athletes that you've talked to. Can you just say that one more time? Yeah, no problem. So some of the athletes I've uh, talked to, for example, and I'm talking about a female athlete, even she was telling me, you know, it was like a hundred grams of protein a day, 120 or so. Um, 350 grams of carbohydrates and then another hundred or so of um, fat. And um, there, you know, as I say in the last three or four years, it's become this like heavy um, influence of carbohydrate for these athletes to fuel their endeavor for the CrossFit Games level athletes. And my biggest concern with that is how it influences the average CrossFitter, people who don't need to be eating like that and people who might be very sensitive to carbohydrate even borderline insulin resistant going in and, and then that cut, they see that and hear that messaging and it just hurts them and hurts their efforts in the gym. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and then for you, you said, you know, for some of the workouts, you, you were able to match some of your, your times or numbers or whatever it is. And then, uh, and, and sometimes it's really close. Have you noticed anything else that, if there was a slight drop off in performance in some areas, uh, increases in other aspects of whether it be recovery or cognition or whatever it is that would offset some of the, the um, decreases in performance. One thing I want to say that'll tee off to something Thomas could then carry is um, when we were doing one of our early rucks, he talked about this and then I felt it in experimentation and it was really cool. Um, basically training in a facet zone. So I would do this mile and, or actually about two, two mile, two and a half mile run at the ranch. And I did it a lot in the facet zone and I was okay. And then one day I decided to do it after having just fed myself on a regular, like having breakfast and after breakfast before lunch. And I felt really fucking fast and I felt really good. And like, um, he'll talk about, um, performing or, uh, performing in that calorie restricted zone and then how when you are fed it essentially is supercharging you and that's how you would describe it thomas yeah i mean if uh, anyone you know watching or, or mike if you're familiar with the uh, you know train low studies and even the in the sleep low studies it's all relative right so that's how we have to look at things um training and, and i'll say this a little bit more generally training in a deficit regardless whether you're fasting or just generally over maybe let's call it a seven day revolving period in a deficit that is a challenge period and anyone who's ever cut calories aggressively knows that that is a challenge uh, but that is also a hormetic stressor that conditions your body to be able to deal with such effort and uh, deal with such stress so then insert fuel and all of a sudden you're on rocket fuel it's it's you've developed an efficiency there is a caveat, you know, if you do it so much, then you sort of lose the metabolic machinery, if you want to call it that, to efficiently run 
on a f in a field state. You know, and I'll give an example of that. If someone okay. only trains fasted and specifically only trains fasted, and then all of a sudden you give them a 75 gram carbohydrate bolus, they're going to probably claim that they feel worse. And some of it could be psychosomatic, but by and large, it really is a glucose transporter issue. At that point, you've trained so much in a fasted state that you've actually hurt yourself as far as efficiency is concerned in metabolizing glucose and anaerobic glycolysis. That's not necessarily a bad thing if you plan to always train in a fasted state. So, you know, let that be known. However, like as Dave is speaking to, he is periodically doing both. And that's really the idea behind it, right? That this exactly metabolic flexibility at its very finest is doing both. And, uh, mm -hmm. but if you train, I would say 70% of the time in a fasted state, you're going to develop efficiency and you're going to develop efficiency through the areas where most people need more efficiency. And that is that gray area in between aerobic and anaerobic. I should, there is no real gray area. It's a very fine line, but I'm going to call it a gray area because it's that transition and it's that back and forth. And I know Dave, I've talked to you about this and Mike, I think I've talked to you about this separately, but I'll say it for video. You know, my definition of fitness, this is purely my definition of fitness is how quickly you can switch back and forth between aerobic and anaerobic, because you can be an aerobic athlete or you can be an anaerobic athlete, but if you want to be both, you need to be able to switch back and forth really quickly. And if you take someone that's sprinting on flat ground and all of a sudden put them on an incline, I want them to be able to go as far up that incline before they crap out. And that's essentially their metabolic switch and how quickly they can flip over to that before they end up reaching that lactate threshold. And uh, it's a very important thing. And fasting, and there's a lot of studies that actually back this up, like fasting improves lactate clearance. Take that for what it's worth. It does not mean that training in a fasted state is 100% better, but it does help you with clearing lactate. So insert yourself into a position where you are fed, you're still going to develop the ability to clear lactate better because that is that doesn't stop at the workout level, that continues. And if you are clearing lactate, that doesn't just mean you're avoiding the lactic acid burn or the buffering of hydrogen or whatever you want to call it. What it does mean is that you are becoming more efficient at taking that lactate and inserting it into what's called the Cori cycle and ultimately recreating pyruvate and recreating energy via a different method. So you have literally just created almost a perpetual motion device, like where you are creating energy from your own byproducts. And the better you are at clearing lactate, the better you are at being able to go at moderate to moderately high intensity for longer periods of time. Well, it's, that's, so that, that was kind of one of my, uh, and, and we'll get, we're going to get through some of the chapters of the video, but that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about was this idea of CrossFit athletes and not necessarily games athletes, but maybe there is a time and a place for games athletes as well. I mean, who knows where they could be throwing this into their training, but I think even more importantly, as Dave was saying, the general CrossFit athlete um, and experimenting with um, low carbohydrate diets or lower carbohydrate diets, but also, how could they use carbs more strategically uh, to kind of balance out this, this, you know, this dichotomy of improving health and performance, right? Because, you know, just like Dave said, they model themselves after games athletes and it becomes purely about performance and not about health. Yeah. So they, they start, we start eating this super high carbohydrate diet, yet they're not really training like these games athletes. So how can we pull that down and follow something that would be lower carbs, but learn how to use carbs strategi strategically to get the most out of performance while still maintaining a high level of health. Is that a question for me or Dave? Yeah, well, I think you, Thomas, and then okay. Dave, I'd love to hear you jump in as well. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a, it's a tough question to answer because, and I'll make this part quick so I don't ramble on it, but you know, there's this gray area where there's the ketogenic protocol and then there's low carb. And, ketogenic opens up a whole different world of, I'm careful to say benefits because I know people can get cagey about it, but it does open up a whole different world because you are completely shutting out one fuel system and shifting gears into a different one. And it's very black mm. and white. Low carb 
can put you in a gray area where you're not quite getting the benefits of ketosis, but you're also not quite getting the benefits of carbohydrates and you're stuck in the mud in the middle. And I will tell you that that is where a lot of athletes end up. And this is a perfect segue into that. Athletes end up there because they don't go full blown ketogenic for long enough and they start sprinkling in carbs here and there. And that's okay. But we have to be strategic about the timing, which I'll get to in a second. And if I skip that, come back to me on it. But essentially, you know, games athletes, athletes in general that try keto or try or low carb, they might go from consuming 300 grams of carbs down to consuming 100. All they've done there is reduce their carbohydrate and reduce the fuel that their body is currently accustomed to using. Of course, they're going to bonk. If you're going to really commit to low carb, you do have to commit. And that is what is tough on the athlete side because there is this transitional period where they are getting fat adapted, where they are getting adjusted to ketones. And pretty much every body of research that talks about the transition into fat adaptation, ketogenic diet talks about, it's like a minimum of 90 days to really start having this shift over. And it's not mental. I mean, it really is transporter dependent. And what I mean by that is, you know, your cells require specific transporters to let fuel in. They're like shuttle buses. You have shuttle buses that bring glucose in and you have shuttle buses that bring fats in just like supply and demand. If you have a lot of glucose, you're going to start increasing the amount of transporters that bring carbs in. If you start increasing the fats and decreasing the carbs, you're going to start increasing the amount of shuttle buses that bring fats in. That takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. So there is a gray area. This is this like dead period. And that is almost invariably what happens with athletes for two reasons. One, they try it, they bonk and they quit, or they really want to do it, but they just don't have the time to commit to having a 10% or 15% drop in performance during this transitional period. Like they're, sure. they're really like, they've got sponsorships on the line. They've got all this stuff and they freak out and rightfully so. I totally understand that. It's very difficult. So, cause I talked to a number of people just in different athletic settings, the NFL, NHL, and they run into the same kind of thing. Like, I really want to try it and they have to try it in the off season. They have to commit in the off season and CrossFit. A lot of times there isn't a whole lot of an off season, like depending on what they're doing now for the recreational person, it's an entirely different story because a recreational person needs to really be able to step back and really ask themselves why they are doing this. And CrossFit obviously puts the idea of performance, you know, very, very high. And they do this for obviously good reasons. But when you start skewing that conversation with performance diet, it's like, it's difficult because you have to have like two opposing conversations. You have to have a performance minded approach to working out with a health minded approach to diet. And those don't always Mm -hmm. jive in people's gray matter when you're talking to them about that because they think performance, I need to eat performance. No, if you're competing at a games level, then yes, you can absolutely deal with that amount of carbohydrates. But if you're doing a recreational CrossFit workout and you're training for between 45 and 90 minutes a day and the rest of the day you're sedentary, you have to be real with yourself about that. You know, you carbohydrates are not bad. And I'm very clear to say that carbohydrates are not bad, but they absolutely positively need to be modulated by activity level, period. Fair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Let's go back really quick to timing because you said you wanted to remind you about timing. So what (laughs) specifically... (laughs) Yes. So what specifically about timing is important? Yeah. So if someone is wanting to try a lower carb approach and they want to continue to maintain performance, there's two very clear ways that they can do it. One is carbohydrate backloading, which is inserting your carbohydrates immediately post-workout. Generally, I'd say for 90% of the people, it's going to be anywhere between 30 and 70 grams of carbohydrates. Uh, The body really does suck up the carbohydrates pretty good right after a a workout because GLUT4 translocation, basically that transporter I talked about, is Mm -hmm. uh, acutely spiked and brought to the surface of the membrane of a cell, and it allows the carbohydrates to come in. So then for someone that isn't deep into ketosis and isn't really wanting to go all the way down that road, that's a perfect strategy. The other strategy is a little bit more nuancy, a little bit more interesting. And that is actually a small amount of carbohydrates prior to performance, which totally, by the way, goes against the grain of the fasted training. So, I mean, put that aside for now. If you're going to have carbs before your workout, you're clearly not training fasted, but it's a different strategy. I just did it today, actually, by the way, I, I trained, uh, I did an hour of interval cardio training specifically this morning, right when I rolled out of bed, I had two meals and I just worked out and did more resistance training, uh, just prior to this, but I was fed, I was fueled. 
And exactly what I did, 20 grams of carbohydrates prior to workout and 20 grams of carbohydrates intra-workout in, in a liquid form. Mm. Like in this case, it was, you know, with some like coconut sugar that I put into kind of a little drink, right? Something higher glycemic. And that's a different ball game. That's again, it gets nuancy, but the reason behind that is you can absorb carbohydrates into the muscle cell independent of insulin altogether, meaning intra-workout as weird as it is, it's the one time that you can be consuming carbohydrates and not spike your insulin at all because the pure contraction of the muscle itself will actually draw the glucose into the muscle cell and you never spike your insulin. So when you're talking about a conversation with uh, diabetics or people that are concerned with insulin resistance, this is the best possible scenario. It's not the sexiest because people want to go and have cake. They want to have their food. But if you are really concerned about performance and if what people are telling me is accurate, because sometimes people don't tell the truth, but they say, no, I, I, I can live without the carbohydrates, but I need them for performance. If that be the case, then enjoy some not so sexy carbohydrates in a liquid form during your workout. That way you get your performance, you get the carbohydrates into the muscle and the rest and, and not having to deal with any insulin resistance issue. And the rest of the day, go about your moderate protein, moderate fat diet. If, the, if okay. there, that's pretty cool, Dave. Have Thomas, you experimented have with any of that? For you. I have a question for Thomas. If there was an, a CrossFitter who is slightly yep. overweight and they've been going to the CrossFit gym for a few months and they heard about keto and said, "Hey, I want to try this keto thing," and continue going to the Cross uh, to their regular one-hour class, um, would you think that's a fine recommendation for someone in that situation? They want to try keto. If they're they cagey and they really and they don't want to, want to try, get... And they want to try to lose weight with keto and continue to CrossFit. What would you say to that person? What would your recommendation be? I would say jump in with both feet. Okay. I wouldn't mess around with the carb manipulation. Yep. Yeah. I would, not, I would not mess around with the carbohydrate manipulation for someone that is actually eager to jump in. Because in my experience, not only in real life, but just on my channel in general, analysis paralysis, the more crazy things you throw at them. Athletes love to get mm. weird with stuff, like, right? Like, I mean, you'll eat, like, I'd probably eat a dog turd if someone told me it wouldn't perform, make me perform better. It's just, it doesn't really matter. It's just, <laughs> but when you get down to people that are actually like in a serious situation, their doctor tells them they need to lose weight. They really have a call to action. No, jump in with both feet and take the, the hit on the front end. You know, I, I just don't, someone that is, if someone came to me and they had a hundred pounds to lose and they had a choice of losing that hundred pounds faster and possibly losing 10% performance or vice versa, I think we know the answer, right? And I think they would rather, they would, they don't care. They'll take 10 pounds off their bench press uh, if it means that they can lose that hundred pounds faster. So if someone is 100%. actually committed and wants to try the ketogenic diet, then absolutely jump all the way in. I'm used to having a conversation where I'm a little bit uh, having to defend. So when yeah. someone is ready to jump in, by all means, go right into it. Well, and that's what's cool yeah. what you see. And, yeah. and Mike, we've I think seen it's this the, one of the over the years is like CrossFitters for the most part because of their desire to uh, make improvement or change and they've committed something like CrossFit. They'll dive into any, not anything, but they'll dive into recommendations all the yeah. way and, and stay true to the, um, prescription with a, um, with a crazy focus, crazy level of focus. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest, uh, I don't know if you want to call it misconceptions though, is, is, is uh, just this understanding of what, what, um, what results you can expect being a general CrossFitter, you CrossFit one day or, or once a day, an hour, an hour a day and how to eat to perform when i say perform well as a crossfitter too it's not like the games you know when you look at a games athletes they're trying to perform really well a couple times a few times a year really right so they have to really kind of stack the cards in order to maximize performance for very specific times whereas the general crossfitter wants to like steady increase in performance and health throughout years and i think those two goals alone uh really change how they should be eating. And if you're in the category of long-term results, modeling yourself off of 
a group of athletes that are trying to get results as quick, quick as possible for a couple of days a year doesn't necessarily jive or make sense. I think that a lot of times that's where a lot of the misconceptions take place. Yeah, that's a fair point. I have, a, I have yeah. another question. Uh, well, let's get into this. Mike, we... let me ask one more question, please. Go ahead. So, um, and this, I don't know if yep. you have the answer right away, Thomas, but I was, I'm going to ask this anyways. If we brought you into a CrossFit gym right now and there's 30 people of varying levels and variabilities and the owner said, Thomas, I'd love you to give a 15, 20 minute talk on nutrition. What would you say to a group like that? Hmm. Good question. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, candidly, it would, it would almost be more of a quasi somewhere between keto and zone. Really. I would say, you know, Hey, cut out refined starches, cut out, uh, you know, hyper palatable foods, step one, which is very generic, but a lot of times uh, that makes a pretty big dent as soon as the hyper palatable stuff is out of the equation. Uh, I'm not really opposed to carbohydrates, especially when they're coming from fruit and especially when they're coming. So that's usually my, my go-to when people not being able to have my finger on the pulse of what everyone in that room thinks, because usually it's split kind of 50, 50, right? If I go into a room of 30 people, 15 people are going to be uh, totally game for low carb and 15 people are going to be totally game for not low carb. And it's funny. Mm -hmm. It goes back to a a conversation. You were there and we had the conversation with Greg and it was so funny how people will get very defensive about uh, if you talk about low carb, but when you start framing it in a different way where I'm going to ask you to eat, uh, you know, a plate of moderate amount of lean meat, lean chicken, maybe some turkey, maybe some fish, maybe a smearing amount of red meat, you know, a little bit of fruit, a few grains here and there, you know, maybe some olive oil. When you start putting it like that, it's like everyone's going to say, yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable. OK, well, I just described modified zone or I just described, you know, a modified sure. ketogenic diet with a fair bit of carbohydrates. It's just like we have this immediate shield that goes up. But answering that question, the first thing that I would tell people to do is exactly what we said in the beginning of this. Say, okay, eat a larger breakfast, eat a smaller lunch, and eat a very small dinner. And I want you to try doing that. And simply from a psychological aspect, what that does to how much they consume is very powerful. The next step beyond that, I would tell them start to eat a higher fat breakfast and taper the fats off as the day goes on. Caloric density, being able to deal with the fats better. Don't even have to go into an explanation as to why. But explaining that usually does quite a bit. But I would probably advise almost all of them to be having under 100 grams of carbs per day. And that is pretty reasonable. And it usually gets people the taste of low carb enough where they can kind of make their own decision that, hey, I'm not dying. I actually feel better with this. Um, but there's so many nuancey things. But that's that's the basics of it in 15 minutes. That, that was great. That seems that early yeah, time restricted feeding. I appreciate that. I just... Yeah. That was cool. Now you, it's a difficult one. My, it's a hard. It's a hard one to answer, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Now you can have your. Interview. What's that, Dave? You can have your interview back, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, jump in whenever. No, I think that was great. I think. I mean, it seemed like there were three, three main takeaways there. One being the early time restricted feeding, and kind of tapering off throughout the day. Two, a reduction of processed food and eating whole natural foods. Three minimizing carbohydrate to something around a hundred grams per day, you know, like three things reasonably, I don't want to say easy to follow because that's really dependent on the person, but at least a, a simple recommendation. Yeah. I just, I will add one more that I think it's very powerful that now comes to mind as we say that. And this is one that I tell people all the time is snacking is not the answer. Having consolidated meals is better. I'd mm-hmm. rather someone have three square meals than six small meals because the whole stoking yeah. the metabolism thing doesn't really apply. It's more right. about having eat every two to three hours. No, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's just all that's doing is keeping insulin levels high all the time, which, you know, whatever yeah. we can go back and forth on carb insulin model carbon, but that's not what I'm here to say. My point is that when you have sure. consolidated eating windows and you have, you know, the rises in blood sugar and then the subsequent rise in glucagon after that glucagon is what's going to allow the fat burning to actually start happening. And if you're consistently munching on things, you're kind of quelling that all the time. So I'd rather someone sit down and eat a bigger breakfast, a bigger lunch and a bigger dinner if they have to, than eat a moderate to, you know, it's the moment you start snacking, it's all out of control. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, this is great. I mean, Thomas, I'm not sure if you've been to the level one, but it's uh, it's really cool because a lot of what you say um, matches uh, some of the just traditional CrossFit nutrition recommendations. 
uh, throughout our methodology. So it's just really cool to see that synergy without even having talked about this much uh, prior to this interview. So super cool. All right, let's go into this event. I mean, we, we I'm glad we talked about what we did because I think that's some really important stuff. It's super important for the people of Washington, the people in the CrossFit community. And there's always a lot of questions on these things. And we can continue to pull some of that out as we go through the event as well. But I'd like to talk about some of the um, physiological changes that you were talking about throughout the the hours, which was what, like 10 hours, 10 and a half hours, 10 hours, 50 minutes? Just under 11 hours for Dave and I of yeah. active moving time. It was closer to, okay. I think it was about 12 hours total because we, we had rest, we had stops because we were filming and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's start with part one. Uh, one of the first things that you talked about as being one of your biggest concerns was cramping. Uh, what, what, how come this was a fear? What, what were the expectations here um, with cramping? Yeah. Uh, given that I'm pretty prone to cramping, I'll just say I was surprised I did not actually. Uh, mm. I think my strategy with proper hydration and probably pounding close to seven, eight, nine thousand milligrams of sodium throughout the, fat, uh, the event probably made a big difference. Uh, so that was a, yeah, that was definitely concern number one for me because I knew metabolically I could handle it. I was more concerned about, yeah, what's going to, what's going to happen because I've had debilitating cramps at high altitude before and have had to you know, hunker down overnight just because it's like, okay, I can't walk, I can't move. And it's a, it's a serious concern, especially for me front facing on camera on my channel. I didn't want to be the embarrassment that was held back by a cramp at 11 miles in. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. Dave, did you cramp at all? No, I didn't. I wasn't too worried about cramping. Uh, interestingly, I didn't even, I don't even think I took my first swig of water until about an hour and a half into it. Through the whole thing, I was surprisingly not that thirsty. Um, and we were supplementing with the sodium, as he mentioned, uh, huh. throughout. But yeah, I was at, by the end of it, I was really surprised how little I did drink. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, and you did talk about essentially different types of cramps. One of the cramps you're talking about is if your muscle contracts, but it has a hard time, you know, releasing. Uh, yep. What are what are different uh, types of cramps like an athlete can experience and you know, prolonged event or, in a, or, or a day that has multiple events and how can they structure their um, electrolyte intake to prevent or, or combat those different types of cramps? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's multiple types of cramps, but really two that are the main focus, especially for uh, anyone that's doing any kind of uh, athletic endeavor. Potassium cramp is a cramp that's going to occur during a workout. A magnesium related okay. cramp is one that's going to occur after. And that's as simple as, okay. you know, potassium is actively involved in the immediate muscle contraction, right? So potassium opposes, or I shouldn't say opposes, but in a colloquial way, it opposes sodium, whereas magnesium colloquially sort of opposes magnesium or calcium and magnesium kind of oppose each other. So there's different mm -hmm. and they're, they're happening in different settings. And so potassium is like the reset button on your computer or on a slingshot. Sorry, my microphone, it, it like. Last I had this adjusted, it was really cold here and now it's like warmer. So the, it's like the hydraulics keep moving it down. It's mm. driving me nuts. Anyway, uh, so potassium is like a slingshot. Whereas if you're trying to fire sodium to actually create this action potential for the muscle to contract, potassium yeah. is what pulls it back. And without okay. potassium, you stay contracted, which is exactly why you cramp in a workout because the muscle remains contracted. Potassium is going to, for lack of a better term, allow that relaxation. Now, magnesium mm. cramps are the ones that you get when you're laying in bed after a workout and all of a sudden your leg cramps up and you wake up in the middle of the night because you have a charley horse. That's much more magnesium related because you're not actively contracting the muscle. It's happening, uh, you know, sort of at the, what's called the sarcoplasm, sarcoplasmic reticulum level. It's happening where there's a magnesium calcium gradient because when you have an action potential, you have sodium that travels down, acts on dendrite down the, down the nerve, ultimately triggers calcium and magnesium to have a relationship at a muscle at a, a muscle cell level and that's sort of secondary so when that happens when a muscle decides to randomly spasm and you're not working out it's because there's a calcium influx and that calcium is causing the muscle to contract at the very very muscle level versus just the neural level does that make sense yep so would you would you try to intake more potassium prior to or during an event, and then magnesium after an event to um, uh, reduce risk of each type of cramp, or 
have it all together. No, that's that's exactly right. I don't like to uh, taking magnesium intra event is always a risk because of the GI distress that could the occur. stomach stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah so okay. magnesium definitely. You know, people have taken magnesium for years to help with constipation and. Most of the time, people don't experience a problem with it, but it's not worth the risk, right? Because if it's going to go, it's going to go, and it's not very fun. So, was that uh, some of the stomach issues you were having later on in the ruck? Yeah, was that no, due to I mean, just not not too bad. I think you know, my I don't know what really caused my stomach issues. It wasn't too bad. Mm -hmm. It was just a little bit of distress. I was probably, if anything, I was probably hyperhydrated, probably drinking too much water. Mm -hmm. um, so I probably should have kind of attenuated that a little bit, but no, okay. my GI issues weren't too bad because I didn't have much magnesium. I always take in close to a thousand milligrams of magnesium a day myself anyway, just because I'm a, I'm a heavy oxidizer of it. But you know, I usually try to keep like a, you know, four to one ratio of sodium to potassium kind of intra. So I usually, you know, for every thousand milligrams of sodium, I'm taking in two to 250 milligrams of potassium kind of somewhere in there. And that usually is the nice balance. And the reason sodium is always skewed higher is because sodium is going to allow for the retention of those other minerals. So if my sodium levels are adequate, then I don't need to be worrying about bringing in boatloads of magnesium because I'm retaining it more because the sodium is allowing for that retention. Okay. Awesome. No, that's super helpful. Um, let's go down. The, so that's that was right off the, the, the start. And then um, around, around the six mile point and maybe up to 12 miles, you started to say that, um, you know, mentally and cardiovascular things were going well, but power output really started to drop off. Like it was a lot harder to maintain uh, the pace. What was going on there? Yeah. Mile six, everything was rocking. It was between six and 12 where in a simple sense, you start to lose that pep in the step, just the explosivity. And that's just because by that time, with weight on your back, most people have burned through a good majority of their muscle glycogen. So at this point, mm -hmm. you're, you're just your ability to kind of fire and get this big kind of explosive movement from just the utilization of glucose is kind of gone. And now you're just kind of starting to shift into pure beta oxidation a little bit more. Basically, you've, you're starting to burn through the majority of your fuel. It wouldn't happen at 12 miles if you didn't have weight on your back. It probably happened more like 15 or so. But you start to hit sort of a little bit of that wall and it's soft I mean, you just don't have the pep in your step. And I think all of us kind of felt that where it wasn't, nothing was bad. You just, you can feel it. You know, I start feeling like, okay, I'm feeling more in my calves now because I'm not pushing off the way that I should. I'm heel striking more now. I'm not pushing off the ball of my foot. Okay. Dave, how did you feel there? Did that, is that similar to your experience? I think I felt decent at that point. I, I think all of, I, I started I'd say not crumbling, but I, I felt most of my issues towards the last uh, 10 miles and primarily just impact feet were just like getting beat up. Feet felt sore, but other than that, I felt, and then at the end, it was definitely way slower than Thomas. So like, it was interesting because his walking pace for me to keep up with him towards the end, I had to jog just to keep up with him. And just cause my, I was so fatigued and just breaking down. Um, I wasn't able to keep up with Thomas towards the end. I did keep up with him, but it took some work to keep up with him. But then you, did, did it feel easier? Did the change in gait pattern actually make it feel easier for you? For me, yeah. I, I, or were you just determined to keep up with him? No, like my feet were starting to hurt. And so like when I started jogging, it just felt like a relief from just the pounding uh, on the same gate. It did actually feel like a relief. Um, I wanted to kind of stride it out and run a little more, but I also didn't want to deal with that because it would have, that would have been painful, <laughs> but I kind of did want to go there. So, um, it was kind of a nice mix of the two. We would have looked like a couple of weirdos too. We were just like running with packs down there. I mean, yeah. it's like, especially with our, we probably would have looked kind of goofy. Yeah, that was another. <laughs> Did you guys get some looks anyways? We, during we the, oh yeah. Well, we had, a, I mean, a, yeah. Drawing a lot of eyeballs. Like look at these weirdos just sprinting down, running down the uh, beach with their backs on. <laughs> oh man, yeah. that was awesome. Yeah. I noticed when, uh, I, when I would break into a run, 
something about the like the the split second of the pack kind of with gravity it would like running the pack would kind of elevate a little bit and it was like less compression on the lower back so even that nanosecond uh, of less compression actually felt good it was almost like you know the back would kind of lift when you <laughs> so actually, yeah. yeah um all right at the halfway point you said uh you know there was this assumption that you're producing a, a, a whole bunch of, of ketones is that essentially because of that switch over you you had tap through uh, blood glu- a lot of the blood glucose and glycogen, and now you're switching over to beta oxidation, oxidation using fat as fuel? Yeah, well, the beta oxidation shift, and beta oxidation is happening the whole time for sure, but you're kind of in that like quasi, a little bit of both. I'd say halfway, it's reasonable to assume that you're probably producing ketones, right? Uh, especially, I can 100% speak for myself based upon how my diet was that I knew I was at least producing ketones and I can feel it, right? And if everyone ate the way that I suggested they ate, then I could probably say with 90% certainty that they were producing a decent amount of ketones at that point. Uh, and you're starting to go through a little bit more gluconeogenesis where your body is taking other substrates and converting those into glucose mm. because it, it's very important to know that your body, like even when you're doing a ketogenic protocol and you're really strict, your body isn't just devoid of glucose. Like if you, your blood glucose sure. doesn't just go to zero, you drop dead. Right? So people yeah. always like, where am I, where am I getting glucose? Glucose is so important. I need it. Well, the body efficiently creates glucose to fuel the brain and it creates glucose to fuel certain cells that need uh, glucose, red blood cells, for example, things like that. Mm. They need glucose. So the body creates it via other pathways, other substrates, and that's called gluconeogenesis. And by this point, regardless of ketone formation, uh, everyone is producing glucose via a different pathway. The body is starting to say, okay, we got to break down remnants of fats, the glycerol backbone, turn that into glucose. We got to break down a little bit of protein, mainly alanine specific aminos, break that down into glucose. So that's definitely happening, but that happens. That is a very inefficient process for the body. So the c- creation of glucose and subsequent fueling of cells and creation of ATP from glucose is slowed down because it's bottlenecked or sort of a rate limiting step by how slow you're producing glucose in the liver. So then the body says, okay, well, we need to maintain stability here. So let's start upregulating ketone production. So at this point, it's fair to assume that there's a fair degree of gluconeogenesis and a decent amount of ketones that are elevating uh, and would only continue to elevate as the ruck went on. Okay. And then, so as this is happening, you're talking about trying to find the pace that allows you to take advantage of, of BHB. Um, one, what kind of pace is that? And two, what would happen if you were to push yourself at an intensity that surpassed that threshold? Very good question. Uh, the pace is highly dependent on the person, but given that we were walking, it's probably you know just in that same three to three and a half miles per hour. The moment that you start, uh, you know, always the old uh, talk test, right? If you can't, if you can't hold a conversation with somebody, you're getting out of that, probably transitioning more into zone three, you know, which not where we want to be. We want to be more in zone two, and you know, possibly zone one would be a little too mild, but zone two is a good place. Once you start getting out of that zone two, like you can't hold a conversation, then yes, you're pushing it too much and you're not going to reap the benefits because ketones fuel at a fairly low speed. They don't, they don't provide you with the fuel when you break into a sprint or they don't provide you uh, with the fuel when you break into a higher intensity. Um, Contrary to what some ketogenic people will tell you, ketones are just a, they're, they're a slow oxidizer. They're not designed for that. When you do break into speed, you're still using glucose. You're just using it via, you know, uh, gluconeogenesis or stored glycogen, which I will make a side mm-hmm. comment that even when you're doing keto, you still store glycogen sure. from those other substrates. Okay. So you still have glycogen stores, especially if you've been doing keto for a while. So for myself and for Dave, who had done a fair bit of low carb work in keto, we could probably break into, and actually, as I'm talking through this, that explains why we felt okay running because we had the ability to shift into that and get into the, and still use glucose better than say Carter and Ben could. And it didn't occur to me until just now talking through this, that that's probably what happened. And if you pushed it too hard, then again, Dave and I could probably have pushed it a little bit harder and metabolically been okay. Uh, if Ben and Carter had have pushed it harder, I think they would have experienced what a marathoner would experience when they hit the wall. They would have just completely bonked. And they would have had to really bring down the intensity to get themselves back on track. Okay, that makes sense. And let's let's dig into something you said. I think is it's based off of 
uh, how you answered this question, but also something you said in the video. You had just said that you guys were a lot, let's just say, more efficient at gluconeogenesis and 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 then uh, creating um, glucose and being able to use that as a fuel if intensity had to go up. Was this something? Uh, is this an example of what you're talking about um, with uh, some of those physiological effects that were a survival mechanism uh, throughout, you know, human evolution? Yes, that's a that's a perfect example of it. Yeah. Uh, we think about it from a survival standpoint, like what is our, as humans, our primary means of survival at this day and age? This is a little bit anecdotal, but it also is backed up with a fair bit of, of research too, is that, you know, we have a prefrontal cortex that's pretty large. So when you look at other animals, uh, their fight or flight is definitely going to be related. Well, I shouldn't say fight or flight because it's a slightly different system, but I will still use it for the sake of this video. If, you know, a tiger goes into a starvation mode, he might get a little bit more brute strength and an ability to hunt and ability to chase and kill humans. Yeah. We might get a little bit of that through adrenaline and through norepinephrine, but really when we are going a couple of days without food and mind you, we've essentially accelerated a fast with this whole project. So at this point, when we're 25, 30 miles in, let's just for simple terms, say that we're, it's almost like we're 48 hours into a fast or something. At that point, we have so much glucose that is not being used by the tissues and being allocated mm. to run to the brain. It's there to fuel us because our best means of survival is our brain and our smarts. So everyone's brain feels pretty darn good. And that's because they have a high presence of ketones and a high presence of glucose. Ketones in the brain are great. They make you feel clear. They can potentially uh, you know, modulate inflammation in the brain because they can cross the blood brain barrier. But make no mistake, you also have an increased level of glucose in the brain when you're deep in a fast. And remember, your cells at this point in the tissue are not using glucose as much. So it's being shuttled to the brain. So you have like double whammy, ketones and glucose in the brain. So you mentally feel on fire. And from a survival standpoint, that's exactly what you would want. We have a better means of survival by crafting a way to trap an animal and using our brain than fighting a grizzly bear, right? Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. You you wanted to play a game called uh, <laughs> it, something about a picnic, right? Yes. I'm bringing this on a picnic or we're going on a picnic. Yeah. And as I watched that, I was wondering if you were trying to test uh, just kind of the mental aspect of the cognition you know, of, of the people that you were with. It didn't seem, it seemed like it wasn't as well received as it could have been. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, why is he doing this? Is this just to, to pass time or is he actually trying to figure out where everybody is mentally? It was a lot of it the past time, but it brought me back to childhood and nobody wanted to play with me. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't seem like they did. I'll tell you this. <laughs> but it seemed like a good, like, because it was like memory and I, everything. It seemed like a good game to test totally it. Totally didn't think of it as a approach past time. I thought Thomas was testing us himself, the whole system. I thought Thomas was doing exactly what you're suggesting, Mike. And that's why at first we kind of pushed against it. And then I was like, nah, that's not. Cool. It seemed, that's what it seemed like. <laughs> let's, let's, in, let's engage with it. Uh, because it does make sense for exactly what you're saying. Yeah. Like that is, and that's super cool <laughs> and aware of like, those are absolutely the type of things we should be testing and working on at that point. So like, um, I, I do, I think it was more about that, even though Thomas might not admit it. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, but... it, it seemed like it had a hidden, a little hidden agenda there. And I thought it was really <laughs> cool just to see, you know, what, how people were thinking and what, how they were doing cognitively. And yeah, that was or, well, let me ask you about that. So, I mean, it seemed like you guys were really good, but you had some experience and you trained uh, through some fasting and, and through some wrecking leading up to this. Um, not to pick on Ben, but, you know, Ben didn't have as much of an experience. And um, how was he mentally and cognitively throughout, say, the, the later half of the event? Did it affect him more or was it more just physical for him due to not training the same way. Those I think guys he had a fair bit of anger to, drive that was so keeping those, him going for sure. Yeah, those guys were done by the halfway point. But what we quickly noticed, and Thomas and I talked about this as we were uh, in front, they were not going to quit. And especially Carter. Carter, so here's his former SEAL yeah. with the ne another Navy SEAL. As bad as his feet were blistered, he was there was no quit in him. And then even Ben, a high-level CrossFitter, like we both knew 
they weren't going to give up. And so, um, and that was at the halfway point. We, we had a conversation about how bad in, uh, how poorly they were doing. So it was a matter of just, um, reassuring kind of dealing with and helping them along, knowing that there, there was going to be yeah. no stepping down. Yeah. They were going to make it either yeah. way. It was just helping them get through it. Yeah. Oh, and that's cool. A, um, ben, well, so I'm sorry. No, go ahead. It's a little delay. Uh, now Ben had made a comment. didn't quite make, didn't make the video just cause we had a lot of material to cut, but he had made a comment that mentally like around, uh, I don't know, probably say mile 25, he was starting to feel really good and he was frustrated because he mentally felt so good, but his body was breaking down. And uh, he, it's a retrospect, kind of wish I left it in the video because it was a good comment, but yeah, he's like, mentally, I feel a fire. Like, and I'm just getting frustrated because I'm so here mentally and I feel so good. Like I can keep going, but my, yeah, my body's breaking down. Oh yeah, that's frustrating. And do you think it just took him a little bit longer to get to that point due to, uh, you know, his experience. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. He just wasn't fat adapted and yeah. all things considered, he crushed it for a, a unit that that's that is that big. Cool. I mean, the big dude is like 230, <laughs> yeah. 240, you know, the furthest distance, as he mentions that he, that he ever really does in terms of work is from ground to overhead. And so it was like for, <laughs> for him to, you know, so just remarkable that he, he did do as well as he did, but yeah, it was purely like his, his organs were doing the right job, right. Producing ketones his muscle cells did not know how to uh, uptake it, period. That's all it was. And I'll say this, yeah, Mike, um, you know, like to say, well, that me and Thomas mm-hmm. were here and then those other guys were here back here. The truth is Thomas was here and I was right about here. Like there was a, when we finished, there was a big difference from how Thomas finished and recovered and how I finished and recovered. Mm-hmm. And so like um, th- there, even amongst, those guys then being lower, Thomas was recovered much faster in much better shape than I was. I mean, it, it, it hit me at the end and uh, I started getting shivers. I started getting cold, like, and it wasn't even that cold. And like, I just kind of, I don't want to say went into shock. I didn't go into shock, but I had a little reaction towards finishing and uh, it took a long time to kind of get my energy back and recover. Whereas Thomas was just like quickly fine. Um, it was it was more on me than like I think we're giving credit. Like it, it did affect me. It hit me at the end. Well, you're a damn good. That's actor. interesting. And, and you're and, and, and David was your idea to go that little extra bit to make it to four thirty five, right? Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> even yeah, given yeah, that I, 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 I uh, being the case. So I wanted to make sure we okay. Were well, legit. well, we got it. We got a pick. <laughs> yes. I wanted to go to the artichoke. So, uh, <laughs> that's the whole other there, I, it didn't like, it kind of made the cut in the video. Yeah. It was, I had this, we had it all mapped out from a production standpoint, as far as different waypoints and different points for interviews and things like that. And somewhere, I guess, you know, based on what we were clocking versus what, um, you know, all trails, which is kind of essentially how we mapped it out. And the topo map had really made it, played it out to be. We were going to go to this artichoke in Castroville. There's a monument of a giant artichoke. And we thought that would just be a funny place to turn around. And that was supposedly like 35.3 miles was what it was actually going to be if we went to the artichoke. But by the time we get to this, what ultimately ended up being the halfway point, you know, we were like, if we had a gondola artichoke, it would have added another like four and a half miles to the, uh, to the actual <laughs> thing. And I was, I was like, ah, screw it. We're going to go to the artichoke. And then Dave was like, Thomas, no, like we said, 35 miles. Like he was all gung for it. And then he kind of looked at his clock and it was more about time. He was like, you know what? That's going to add another, like almost two hours. Like, yeah. fuck that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And what it t- so it took, uh, it took right under 11. So it was like 10 50 or something. How long did it take to recover? Like what was the physical recovery time where you sore, where your joints beat up, feet hurt for days? Like how, what was the recovery like? Thomas got back into it much quicker than I you know, did. For I me, it was a few days off. I had a couple blisters on the outside of my feet. My feet were sore. I maybe took three or four days off of working out, but he was texting with me and he, he started working out probably two days after, right? Or you went for a long walk the next day, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say long. I, mean, I went like yeah, maybe four miles, just took the kids out really slow, let the dogs run off the leash and just, you know, it just kind of walked yeah. and just... Uh, yeah. And just, I wanted to, I wanted to keep moving. And, you know, the next day, yeah. I think, uh, Kalipa had sent me a workout and, uh, 
it's like, well, I guess I'll do it. You know, it was, a, it was probably the wrong, it was the, well, actually, you know what? I mean, I shouldn't say, I, like I recovered fine. It was a lot, a lot more deadlifts than I probably should have done two days after like a lot of compression like oh. that. But I think I, I did like the, uh, but I felt surprisingly really good because I did one training ruck uh, with my sister in Colorado, it was at 6,500 feet elevation and the, you know, so it was already at altitude and the walk itself, the ruck itself had close to 3000 feet of total elevation gain up and down. So we had mm. a lot of up and down and that was a 25 mile ruck, uh, with 35 pounds. Mm. And I was just, I mean, not going to sugarcoat it. I was fucking destroyed. And then two days later I went to, uh, I did some deadlifts and totally threw my black back out and ended up having to get dry needled and, and mm-hmm. kind of corrected. And it was, uh, so, I mean, it was like, I, I should have learned not to do deadlifts two days after rucking. Uh, but you know, a mutual friend of mine, uh, with, with Dave, uh, another buddy, Ben actually had a really good insight and I don't know if it's accurate or not, and, but, but it worked. He was like, he said, Hey, you know, one thing that I kind of learned after long rucks is do a little bit of jump roping and trying to get the athleticism back in your feet. And that actually made a lot of sense to me because mm-hmm. I was, uh, had pounded so much and did so much heel striking. I noticed the next day I was walking in the same way, just heel striking. So I just did some mild, just double under work, just kind of played around with it and just got the athleticism back in my feet. And it made all the difference in the world. Like my feet felt normal again, and I wasn't heavy hitting on the ground when I was walking. So I think that made a big difference this time around. Oh, that's cool. That's a good, that's a good recommendation. Um, all right. Well, what are the lessons learned? So you got through this thing, 35 miles. You know, what was the fast time? At least 12 hours fasted going into it. Took almost 11 hours. What what lessons were learned from this from each of you? And can these lessons be applied to everyday training? Can it be applied to the gym? Um, or is it strictly relative to these longer, more extreme types of events? I will say that I'm sorry, I think- Thomas. Okay. I, th- I think that uh, had Dave hydrated as much as I did and consumed as much sodium as I did, I don't think he would have even had even the moderate level of fatigue that he had. I will say that because I, that's because I would have expected myself to fatigue, but I was like, I'm going to go overboard on the salt and the water on this. And I, when I say overboard, I still mean within control, not crazy. But when we're fasting, when you're in a low carb state, it's, it's no surprise that like you know, your insulin levels drop and you lose a lot more water and a lot more fluids and people really do underestimate how much fluid you lose. They really do. And so I'm like, I'm just going to go over the top. And I think that's why I maintained and also why I recovered. So it's been a big lesson to me, even for my own fasted training. Like I still nine times out of 10, I, or at least eight times out of 10, I train in a fasted state, um, you know, first thing in the morning. And now, like when I roll out of bed, I used to have a thousand milligrams of sodium. If I'm really low carb, I'll have 2000 milligrams of sodium. So, and that has made a difference in my consistency and just my stamina throughout a longer workout. Okay. Well, my biggest lesson learned was just right there. Dave, what are you? Lessons learned. That that was my biggest lesson learned in all of this was I should have uh, probably hydrated better. I I actually think, uh, you know, during it, like I got into this whole kick of like, fuck it, I'm not eating, I, I don't need to drink, I'll just see what my body can do on minimal of both, even though that wasn't the like objective. <laughs> um, uh, so next time I'll drink more water so I do recover quicker at the end. Will you do it again? Will you guys do something like this again? What's the next challenge? We'll do something, not this, but we've talked about we've it. We've been toying we around something with again. Yeah. We, have a few, we have a few things on the idea board that we're playing with but um yeah i wouldn't want to repeat it now we got to go somewhere else do something new you know yeah you gotta do something else yeah yeah Yeah, for sure yeah Yeah. i mean we're we're, you know just without like spoiling a lot of things because it's all conceptual right now but you know we're much more we're both we're both uh interested in like ultra light packing and stuff like that just like i i live in live in tahoe half the year so i mean up here it's like i I just love being able to get out for a weekend and being fasted really allows me to not have to carry much weight uh when i'm when i'm out packing and stuff so uh, we're thinking something like that something that might be a little bit more uh i don't want to say enjoyable but less about just the uh you know putting it into practical application let's put it that way okay well that's good to know that that's actually i mean i will say brings up a very interesting point though, which I was going to say is the, the hydration and the sodium thing isn't always hundred percent pa- practical for backcountry stuff. So mm. that's the thing that would be interesting there is 
you know, we had water stops and people and, you know, especially like there's just a lot less availability to water. I mean, you obviously can pump your water and stuff, but you're not going to carry gallons with you if you're going light. So um, just like anything, hydration is also something that you can grow, that you can acclimate to. Um, the more water you're accustomed to drinking, the more water you're going to require. Uh, so there actually would be some interesting training to happen there. Oh, interesting. Oh, well, yeah, I'm looking forward to, hey, we'll have another interview afterwards. I'm looking forward to hearing all about it and then seeing the video again. And maybe we can all jump on a call oh. and talk about it again. I saw that you were playing around in the Sierras uh, and Mount Whitney and stuff. So you uh, maybe you'll join us on this one. Uh, yeah, as long as it's not Mount Whitney. I did that twice. And, and, and going down this, it snowed a foot the day before out of nowhere. And we didn't have crampons or anything. And it took us extra long to get down. And just being up at 14,000 feet that long, was just, yeah, it beat me up yeah. bad. As I was coming down that second time, I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't need to do Mount Whitney again. I'm good. That one's yeah. That one's checked off the list, but it, yeah. was, it was cool. Yeah, I'm in. Let me know. Cool. I'll do it with you. Sweet. That'd be, cool. That'd be awesome. Well, thank you both so much. Um, I loved really digging into the event, and I think uh, the conversation we had prior to digging into this event was uh, really important and uh, super insightful for the CrossFit community or for anybody, really. But uh, uh, thank you both so much and look forward to uh, talking to you guys again soon. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Appreciate Mike. it. Thanks, Dave. Awesome.